All right. So it's really good to have Carl and Glenn here today. And uh, we're going to be talking about emergence in com complex systems. And uh, I'd just like to give everybody a little introduction to Carl and Glenn. Carl studied physics at uh, UC Berkeley and also has an interest in complex systems and uh, engineering, design engineering. Um, he has an MBA and he worked as a, as a jet pilot, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> For many years as a fighter pilot well i did a lot you know i started fighter my career pilot, as an air force fighter pilot but then uh, you know after retirement i did some other things too. so that gives you a kind of a unique perspective on things and uh, glenn studied physics at uc santa cruz and has done work in robotics and uh, design engineering and so these two guys are going to talk about emergence and i think it's going to be a very very interesting conversation so i'm going to Put the ball in your courts and let you guys go to it. Okay. Well, I'm not sure where to start other than just uh, throw something out there and see what happens. That's good. Uh, listen to some of your conversations in the past, and uh, you were talking about God one and God two. And I think this was an email to you, Karen, that as uh, Trinitarians, as Christians, we have a threefold view and there should be a god number three in the mix so the question is are we missing something if we're only talking about one and two um why why aren't we seeing a three and the suggestion is uh emergence uh gives the clue where that third one is missing so okay so you see emergence a little bit more through a lens through, you're looking at it through a more of a lens of your faith? No, I, I'm, I'm both physicist and Christian. I'm one of those really odd ducks. Okay, that is and, an uh, odd combination, yeah. <laughs> uh, raised in the Lutheran Church, um, uh, gifted a, a quiet faith for my parents that's just been there all my life and uh, discovered physics in high school when I took a physics class and it's became my sort of first love and passion ever since. And uh, on the faith side, you know, I understand where you're coming from, Carl, because the physicist in me looks at it and goes, yeah, this Christian stuff is just kind of silly. But then no, the faith I, I, side, no, 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 not, no, not silly, but no, not it's, silly. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll expand. I'll That's the in. wrong word, but. Not the wrong word, I'll, I'll grant you that, but. Um, I would say I don't have a faith. It's more like something has uh, grabbed me. It won't let me go. It's not a choice. So I spent my life uh, balancing between physics and faith, trying to make sense of them both. My sense is that they're not, they're not different, which is a uh, typical uh, conversation is always to put faith on one side and science on another. And I am convinced that they are both um, different sides of the same coin. So um, lifelong wrestling with uh, the back and forth, I feel like I've gone down a lot of avenues that um, no one on the, the Christian side would ever go down and no one on the physics side would ever go down either. So along in that mix is, is emergence has, has come up as one of those big questions. So Carl, what, what's your interest in emergence? Well, to me, emergence is the is what explains why people of faith and pure physicalist, you know, physicists uh, such as Sam Harris uh, can't talk to each other. Um, but the emergence uh, in complex systems um, actually bridges the gap. So, you know, it's it. Well, of course, emergence in general, now you talked about weak versus strong emergence, and that's a good question, but you know, I'm mostly concerned about consciousness as emergent property in that respect. There's all kinds of things that you can consider emergent and that people have talked to as emergent properties, even of matter. Let's say um, the fact that water is liquid is an emergent property because hydrogen and oxygen themselves are not, <clears throat> um, you know, they, they don't they don't each have 
uh, properties that could automatically um, a priori um, give the property of liquidity at room temperature that water has. I mean, after the fact, you can figure out, yeah, okay, after the fact, we can figure out, but you, you can see how that would be considered more like a weak emergence because you can still explain it after the fact using purely physical processes. In the case of consciousness, though, I don't think that's possible. I don't think you can reduce an emergent property, a strongly emergent property is a property that once it emerges, you can no longer reduce, which might reduce, you can no longer explain what it's doing by a purely physical description of its state. Well, one of the other the um, descriptions that I've heard was that once a, something strongly emerges, it can have a, a backwards causation right. impact where exactly. a weakly emergent cannot. So water could not have any impact on uh, hydrogen and oxygen, but consciousness can have an impact on the whole human person. So that, that's um, a good way to put it. Yes, I would. I would. I think I would agree with that. Yes. Yeah. Um, in, in any case, in the case of consciousness, which is just, which is what, you know, I'm not really worried about the weak emergence sign. It's, mm. it's interesting, but it's not uh, all that critical. When it comes to, to consciousness, though, um, it is critical because to me, it explains how a physical system can give rise to consciousness. But once there is consciousness, you can't explain it in terms of a purely physical description. In other words, you can describe all the current state of all the particles making your brain, all the, all the atoms and its constituents, the initial conditions at, at time T0, and you still can't figure out what consciousness is. Consciousness is a new emergent property of the universe and giving a full physical description of it tells you nothing about it. zero. And I, and you know, I've, I've talked about this before, but there are thought experiments that can be performed. The one of the, one of them I talked about being you know, the modified uh, Libet experiment where, where you ask, um, well, you know, the Libet experiment is the one where, you know, supposedly scientists are able to predict a few milliseconds or, you know, actually tens of seconds ahead of time if a person is going to raise their right hand versus their left hand. Uh, and supposedly indicating, you know, to people like Sam Harris that there is no such thing as free will. Uh, it, even Libet didn't believe that, by the way, but okay, whatever. People will interpret the experiment as they wish. But if you put into the if you put in the additional clause in the experiment that the experimenter has to tell the subject what the prediction is, then the system is formally completely unpredictable. In other words, if you, let's say you can predict in theory, let's like say five seconds ahead of time whether I'm gonna raise my right hand or my left hand, um, I can decide to raise the opposite hand of whatever you predict. If you tell me, I'm predicting you're going to raise your right hand. I'm going to tell you, in fact, I'm, I'm going to make it easy on you. I'm going to make it very deterministic. I'm going to tell you, whatever you say, I'll do the opposite. Basic teenager stuff. It's deterministic, all right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. very deterministic. It's like, if you say, all right, I'll do left. And if you say left, I'll do right. And that makes the outcome completely unpredictable. And this is not a matter of the precision of measurement. You can have infinite precision. It is formally impossible to predict the outcome. And what that tells me is that what changes or what, what determines the outcome in a way or the fact that you cannot determine that a machine, you say a computer, or you can call it the, you know, it, it's, it's the, the demon from uh, Laplace's demon is the classic example. You know, he said, well, uh, the physicist, French physicist Laplace at one point said that uh, if you gave me, if, if you gave him all the positions of all the particles in the universe and their velocities, then he could predict everything in the future that's gonna happen with 100% with precision. Of course, it's, you know, it was a thought, or, you know, or the demon in, in this case, he called it a demon that has perfect knowledge of all the um, 
the positions of the particles in the universe. Um, and so you could predict, you can write predict everything that's happened in the past and predict everything that's going to happen in the future with 100% precision. Uh, but once consciousness emerges in the universe, that's no longer possible because you can make um, conscious decisions to act in a way that's different than whatever prediction could be coming your way. So um, I know people have, have raised objections to that, but I, I actually somebody on the, one of the, you know, I, I posted this on the YouTube comment a long time ago on probably on Paul Vanderclay's video. Somebody actually linked, uh, sent me an, uh, an article, a link to an article that discusses this very issue. So it's a, it, it is a, you know, there's a published paper on this. And if you're interested, I can send it to you guys afterwards by email because um, I've got it on my computer. But uh, I, I've heard a lot of different people talk about Libet's experiments. And one of the things that many people say is that even if Libet, even if Libet's experiments prove that there is no such thing as free will, Libet himself said it, there is a free won't. Right, right. I and mean, that's, uh, that's the other objection that people have is that, uh, yeah, you may not be, you, what the options presented to you may not be free. In other words, they may be deterministic, but you're still presenting options and you can decide which options you're not going to follow. Which, but to me, that's just, just a difference without, you know, it's a distinction without a difference. It, it doesn't, you know. Well, yeah, it depends on which direction you're coming at it from. But let's go back to your, you, you mentioned something about machines and, and uh, that made me think about Glenn's interest in robotics. And I wondered if Glenn, you wanted to throw something in there about yeah. Your work in robotics and how that might go. Well, yeah. Um, there's a number of different things I could throw in or should. Is You're starting uh, with emergence on the consciousness side, which is probably the most complicated example you can come up with. But the physicist in me, physicist in me wants to go back to the most abstract, simple uh, system you can imagine that would still encompass this. And uh, one of the hints is before there was life on this planet, there was no biology. So wherever life came from, it had to come from physics and chemistry. So if you're looking for what we call emergence, yeah, um, my exactly. sense, my intuition says it, it has to be in one of the fundamental aspects of the physics, um, essential creation laws that um, we start with. And I have no, not noticed anyone in the physics world going there. Um, oh, no, there are, there are people. Uh, Stuart Kaufman is a typical example. He, he, mm -hmm. Directly to this. In fact, his, Stuart Kaufman, his interest is precisely in the, uh, you know, the biological aspect that you Okay, is that Kaufman with a C? Um, I, I think I've read okay. his stuff and oh. not found it satisfying. Um, I'm no, going much I think deeper. It, I think his stuff <laughs> is very good. So. Yeah, there you can peel emergence even farther down um, into the laws of physics, I'm finding. So I've reached a point where I'm convinced myself that emergence will be put on a solid, formal, mathematical basis sometime in the future when some physicist gets the gumption and, and time and energy to actually grind the mathematics out. So mostly these days, now that I'm a little bit old, don't have the energy for that is to think about the implications. So then, so, what is your definition? What, what do you think emergence means or is? Uh, well, I think maybe that's a little formal for <laughs> this talk here. So um, I wanted to bring it back to where you started with the Sam Harris versus um, the faith community. Is one of the, if you're sort of buying emergence, then you can look at the Old Testament scripture and you can see a lot of things that seem to make sense from a very practical, even, maybe even scientific uh, perspective. And I think my sense is that's where you're coming from, that you read scripture, you see that there's a lot of stuff there that is worthwhile paying attention to. But you're putting a practical uh, value now on scripture and my experience in the, the faith side with pastors is that they don't like that. As soon as you suggest that scripture has some practical value or there's, there might be some reasons for it to be the way it is, they run away. 
somehow that makes it less spiritual. And so I've, I've been watching this um, uh, chasm arise between, you know, church and, and science because most of the people on the church side don't want to admit that scripture has a practical value. Somehow I think they feel it devalues it. So they put science in one place and religion in another. And just maybe as a footnote, I'm using Christianity because that's what I'm familiar with, but I suspect that this dilemma faces any of the faith traditions. So, um, so pastors will want to keep their faith. So Glenn, to just bring it down to reality, could you give me an example of the kind of scripture that you mean um, in the Old Testament? Um, well, I could give you one if you, uh, we can take a few minutes and work through this. Uh, supposing uh, emergence is a real phenomenon. And since you're uh, experienced in control theory, you understand if, if there's any kind of control system going on, there has to be a time scale for it. So if emergence is happening and you want to have a system that can still evolve, there needs to be some kind of um, delay, uh, inertia to the system so that one individual in the emergent uh, organization doesn't disrupt everything all at once. So if you're looking at scripture, and this is, I think Jordan Peterson notices this, is the Old Testament is a 1,000, 1,500 year record of a society, an entity grappling with reality. And there is ebb and flow there. And in the process, there's a, a learning going on, evolution. And so when you look at scripture, what you're seeing is an experimental record, so to speak. And that's why I think a lot of people um, take value in the Old Testament, because they actually see there's, there's something there of value that people have learned. But then I got thinking, well, this is like the crazy things I think about when I you know, wander down that rabbit hole of faith and physics. Um, years ago when I was at Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz, there was a professor there, uh, Robert Trivers. He's a sociobiologist. He's famous. <laughs> He's yeah, yeah, famous. he wrote the forward for Richard Dawkins' book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a chance to attend some of his forum lectures. And it's even as a Christian, it really stuck with me. I, I believe he's probably a flaming atheist. Uh, I'm not sure, but I would judge not that. Not sure, but I've read some of his work. Yeah. Um, oh, incidentally, he was uh, Brett Weinstein's mentor when Brett was at UC Santa Cruz. And that's, that's an interesting take on because Robert Trivers was in the Black Panthers. Uh, it was Huey Newton's one, godfather for one of Huey Newton's kids. And Angela Davis was at UC Santa Cruz back then too. So yeah. there's a little wonders, wonderments I have about Brett's background. But one of his lectures, and this is what always intrigued me, is he was you know, academic, you know, somebody who clearly rejects religion, but he was the first person that um, found fault with Darwinian evolution. And he made a really good point that you can't evolve a species on a geological time scale. Um, climate change and things like that don't work. He pointed out to force evolution, you need something that comes and goes on a three or four generation cycle. There has to be a winnowing, you know, a, a new gene or new mutation happens. Then you look for a winnowing process that, that you know, hits the population in a negative way, reduces it down to a handful of individuals. Then you need a period of positive feedback where those survivors come back, repopulate and back and forth. So that's what his theory um, ideas were. You look for something on the time scales of three or four generations down and then back up again. And so if life is a form of emergence, then maybe that's a hint on the time scales that you should look for. So I went back and I started looking at the Old Testament again. And one of those time scales that really jumped out at me was uh, beginning of the Ten Commandments, when he says, um, visiting the sins of the fathers, plural, under the third and fourth generation. And so I'm wondering, okay, fathers meaning people who, not a, a parent, but the people who decided things in society. And 
So I've always got wondering, because you could also replace that and say, visiting the righteousness of the Father, son of the third and fourth generation too. And so I'm wondering if, and I'm not a biblical scholar, I don't know the timeline of the Old Testament, but I'm curious if, if you looked at it, you would see a cycle of three or four generations down and then three or four generations back up again. And that would be a pretty good clue that you're looking at emergence. You do see that cycle all the way through the Old Testament. Yeah, so... I mean, when you look at the book of Judges, it just, that, it just rise right through the book of Judges. And every time you come back, the, the Jewish faith is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's beyond where it was before. And uh, I think you see the same thing in Frederick Hayek's book, Road to Serfdom, where he points out that National Socialism just, it didn't appear one day. It was actually a multi-generational process going back, you know, to the 1800s. So I'm, I've been kind of looping on that, so to speak, the last you know, month or so, looking for examples like that in society. But I think this might touch on things that you've said, Carl, that if emergence takes place on a generational time scale like that, you can't judge society's you know, social experiments based on a decade or even a generation. Um, if you know, you can play, you know, national debt game for a generation or two but then down the road it's going to hit everybody um, a lot of social experiments that we've had with um oh i don't want to get politic political but uh that we're seeing i think started back in the 60s are now playing out and we're basically about our second generation or so third generation from the 60s and things are basically falling apart and i think you've commented on on aspects of that so oh, well, yeah, Karen and I are in agreement on that, you know, on, mm -hmm. on, on the fact that the free markets and all that, but we don't like to get in. Well, what I'm more concerned about here is, uh, seems to me, it's not clear in my mind that you're making a, uh, I, you know, maybe you can clarify this, but it seems to me you're using the word emergent to apply to what would just simply be evolved systems, which are completely, well, I mean, they're related, but they're not the same, you know? So, so systems do evolve, but emergence is a radical break, a radical break. I mean, it's, it's like a jump. It's not, you know, evolution is this, yeah, it goes by fits and starts, but overall there's kind of like this continuity to it, you know? I mean, obviously, when a new species emerges, you can call that a break. But to me, emergent is a radical break with what's existed before. You know, it's it's a completely new feature of the universe mm -hmm. that didn't exist before, as opposed to a more gradual transformation or evolution of of the universe. So, well, surely the emergence of life had to be that. Yeah, well, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. the two, the two yeah. radical immersion, life and consciousness. Okay, these are the two yeah. things for sure. And I yeah. started with consciousness, but I don't mean to dismiss. In fact, like I say, I mentioned Stuart Kaufman, his take on emergence has more to do with biology and, and the emergence of life. Um, well, so, so just very briefly, what is Stuart Kaufman's idea about how life emerged? Mm. Uh, I re read his stuff and I, I remember just sort of passing on it after a while. So but you, you well, can... Let, let, let's ask Carl, because Carl seems to admire it, so... No, but I mean, he doesn't pretend that he knows how it emerged. He just says life is radically, is radically different than inert matter. That's what counts. I mean, and, and because of this, you end up having, you know, throughout evolution, you have completely unpredictable processes cropping up all the time. You give the example, I think, of, a, you know, like a, an animal, I think he, he uses a, some kind of fish that has a, a swim, you know, a flotate, and what do you call it? I don't have the right term, but it's a, a bladder that can kind of regulate it the way it, uh, it you know, floats in the water. And um, it turns out that the evolution of that bladder uh, turned out to be a suitable habitat for certain types of bacteria, which, you know, it, nobody could have predicted this from pure physics. I mean, it's just like one of these things that life finds a way. 
uh, where um, you have things that are designed for a certain purpose, but somehow now find are a, a different purpose than what it was designed for. And it's the interaction, it's, it's the incredible complex, complexity of life that allows this to happen. So in complex systems, you know, one of the characteristics, uh, particularly in uh, self-referential complex systems that have uh, feedback loops, um, one of the characteristics of complex systems is precisely that they are unpredictable, right? So, um, so they, they defy the Newtonian or Laskian view of the universe where, you know, given, uh, given the, all the data about where all the particles are at time t zero and what their velocities are, we can predict and retrodict everything that has happened and will happen in the universe with 100% precision. In complex systems, we know that's impossible. It's, well, okay, it's, but you just, it's you not just, even a matter of the precision of the measurements. It's a, it's a matter that is formally impossible to predict a system because there are so many feedback loops feeding on each other that it would take, I mean, it's just not possible to compute what's going to happen in the future. Well, so but, you, but you've taken a huge leap forward from, you know, we, we started, we were talking about, there's just two things, right? The emergence of life and then the emergence of consciousness. These are the two big breaks, okay? All right. We can spend all day long talking about all the vagaries of evolution and the complexities of that and all that, but, but let's just stick with those two things. You like to talk about the, the uh, emergence of consciousness, but let's go back to this thing about the emergence of life. That, we're going way, way, way back, okay? So, um, one of the most compelling videos that I watched about that, and I can't remember the guy's name, but I'll, I'll, I'll link to the video. Um, he was talking about life emerging out of the, the warm water and the iron and all kinds of stuff in uh, the rocks. Down that's the water, kinda... you know. You know, but I mean, he had, at least he had a theory. He had a very complex oh. theory about the way the earth breathes and and how this affected the emergence of something that could become life. At least he had a theory. But I, I know you don't care for James Tour, but James Tour does a lot of work on how biology came out of chemistry. And uh, he sees just massive problems in most of the theories about how biology might- Yeah, be. I'm not concerned about that though. That's, that's just not relevant to the discussion. I well, mean, so, it, so then where does life emerge from if it's not emerging? No, what, what's, what's important is that life is radically different than uh, purely physical systems, you know, purely uh, inert systems, let's say physical inert systems. Uh, what characteristics, characteristics all uh, systems in the universe is that, um, you know, the, the, the law of entro you know, entropy increases everywhere. Uh, uh, in a closed system, I should say, because in open systems, of course, that's not necessarily the case. But uh, um, but uh, life is uh, you know goes against that trend of inc so increasing entropy means, and this is controversial. But it, in general, you can take it as an increase in disorder. You know that that things tend to trend towards becoming more disorderly compared to their original state. And life seems to be bucking that trend because it's 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 an ordered system um, that is created from disorderly um, sub sub parts, you know. So it, it uses what's around it to uh, to create order. Um, it, it it is a self-sustaining order. So you know, homeostasis, I guess, is the right word for it. So it, it is self self-sustaining. But what distinguishes life from um, inert systems is that inert systems, they can be, um, let's say like, um, like a, um, a, a tornado, or you don't even have to look at a, a tornado, but a, uh, you know, one of the simply a, a mini, uh, what, I don't kind of remember what you call it, but it's just a dust devil, you know, that, that just swirls around the desert. Mm -hmm. 
is a, a self-sustaining for a while, you know, for a certain amount of time. It's a self-sustaining physical structure that uses the energy potentials around it to form itself and then sustain it, itself for a while. What life does different, though, but, but it is dependent on the existing uh, energy differential potentials in its locality. The difference with life is with life, you have the emergent property that life will actually seek out and, and actively go towards uh, where energy differentials exist. So it's not dependent on the local environment it will actually seek out and move towards or use, you know, um, potentials that it can see somewhere else. Now, obviously, to do that, it has to be able to detect that. So it has automatically some kind of sensory capability. Of course, it can be very different than what humans, you know, sense uh, have evolved to be. But that's what characterizes life. It it it, it actually is a system that actually seeks out um, energy, uh, put, you know, put energy potential differentials and tries to equalize them uh, as fast as possible. Okay, so, well, let's, let's, let's start with that. I don't know if you agree with that definition, um, Glenn, but, but well, let's go back to your idea of, of the emergence of life and, and take, take your thinking through that. Well, I agree with a lot of it, but as, as a physicist, what frustrates me with all of the stuff I've been reading, you know, um, is they'll talk about radical difference or change, or, but it's never formally stated exactly what happened that makes something different. And so a lot of the, in fact, I'd say all of the um, readings and, and listings I do on emergence end up kind of going nowhere because no one can actually put their finger on exactly what it is that's different. And so that's been my interest to, to dive down as far as I can into the physics of things to see where this, what we call emergence actually happens. And you get down to the level in, in physics, you start to see it in the Maxwell's demon, the, an, an intelligent, um, free world agent that can interact with the physical system. And they've been proposed some very, you know, the whole, Maxwell's demon is a long ways from a human with consciousness. And so that's where life starts to appear is, is the ability to make a choice. And I think- so, wait, let, so let's just clear this up for the viewers. Maxwell's demon is when you have, let's say you have a closed system and you have a whole bunch of particles in there Mm -hmm. randomly moving around and there's a, a, a division between the two sides and Maxwell's demon can open the door when certain particles are moving and let them in and eventually mm -hmm. get all the particles over on one side instead of being on the other. So he defies entropy. Right. So you can create a temperature spread difference out. It's organized between two sides and then have yeah. a heat engine that runs off of that to, to pull energy. So the, the demon is, is, looking at, is taking information out of the system and using it to turn it into energy. Um, there is a Sillard's engine, which is basically one molecule in a box. <laughs> They've simplified it down pretty good. Um, but the Maxwell's demon, as it's usually done, is separating molecules, but a life form would be taking information to extract energy. So you're right. I've, I've come to say life exists in the waterfall. You, you, you need some kind of um, disequilibrium and a life form comes in and takes advantage of that by its choices to extract energy and then use it to self-replicate, self-organize. Well, yeah, I'd be careful about the word choice here because yeah. bacteria has a choice. They it do. does what it does, you know, and that's I, I think that's one of the problems why emergence has never gone anywhere is because people assume choice is something we humans do and they look at a plant or a bacteria and say, well, that's not me. That doesn't do what I do. So whatever it is doing can't be choice. No, cho choice, choice can only be a real if you can predict the future, which we can. No, the humans can't predict the future. That's what reason, that's why, that's why rationality evolved. That's why reason, the, the capacity 
or even evolve, not, not exclusively, but at least partly to be able to predict the future, which is a huge evolutionary advantage. Okay, See, just I, I a second now. What, let, let, let's stop for just a second here. Let's clear up this idea about choice. Carl, did I understand you to say that a bacteria does not have a choice or it does have Correct. a choice? Correct. It does not have a choice. So when a... When it a, doesn't predict... It, it's going to go wherever it feels like it needs to go to feed, to, 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 you know, to sustain itself and then eventually replicate. In the case, I'll rep, you know, asexual reproduction, so it's, uh, what is it, uh, mitosis. So completely... De so for bacteria and ants and... Critters like that. Well, then, I, 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 even at the ant level, I'm not 100% sure anymore. <laughs> okay, well, I know the bacteria, <laughs> the level you, know, you could <laughs> argue, yeah, you, you can at some point, you know, but of course, these are very difficult questions. But uh, for sure, at the human level, though, there is no question, you know, that you have free will, uh, you can. Um, you know, maybe a dog has some amount of free will, a cat, you know, a dolphin. I mean, that's, these are questions that we are not able to answer right now. Okay, but we're not talking free will right now. We're just talking about choice. And, and I mean, I, I don't but know. Choice and free will I, I, are one and the same. I'm not a physicist, but same. when I think choice, I'm just thinking binary, man, one or zero, it's on or off. And, and, and at that level, it certainly seems to me as though there's some choice involved there, but I want to go back to Glenn and let him follow his thread through there. Okay, well, <laughs> you said a bunch of things and I'm starting to forget what I was going to say already. But <laughs> for me, um, choice implies unpredictability. And in fact, that's the very essence of choice is that it's not predictable what's going to happen next. See, that's so actually, agent actually has the exact a free opposite. Will. I have the exact opposite. Yeah. Okay, but let's let Glenn, let's let Carl, let's let Glenn flesh out his idea and yes. then you can go back and respond to it, Carl. So if you go back to the basic laws of physics there and you, and you play the Newtonian calculus game, differentiable continuous functions, everything's reversible. There's no place for a choice to happen. Um, but I've spent a lot of time in cellular automata <laughs> lately in the last few years and gets into artificial life forms and stuff. And choice is a binary possibly, but it's, it's a separation. Um, and the key I think needs to be added to physics is the notion that the future is not completely determined by the past history of the universe. That the, the universe uh, allows for choice that there's possibly two paths ahead and a system, an intelligent system can act to pick one or the other. So that's, to me, strong emergence is intelligence acting. So any place you see a uh, strong emergence, you're seeing intelligence. And life is a self-sustaining intelligent system. And so you can take that abstraction way down to bacteria, um, and probably even farther to whatever the, the proto life forms that appear on the earth. And you can see it, um, collective systems can form, become life forms. That's one of the interesting things I've run across is uh, an ant colony can be treated as a single individual by itself. You can actually give an ant colony an IQ test, even though it's composed of a lot of individuals. So that's often one of the cases for strong emergence where you see something new happen. Um, but the ant colony is acting intelligently. It's making choices. And again, that's, that's how you measure IQ is you, you, you create a stimulation and then you let the system run against the simulation. And then you, you have collect complexity measures on your simulation. So I think I'm getting way far, but I think where you're going to see emergence, and I believe you, this is going to be doable, is it will show up as one of the laws of thermodynamics that says choice is possible. In other words, the laws of physics are not perfectly deterministic, that there are points when multiple well, options we appear. We know they're not, right? Quantum mechanics, I mean. Uh, well, quantum mechanics is interesting because uh, the probability um, 
there's, there's probabilities for what the outcomes are, but the outcomes all preserve whatever symmetry it is, energy or momentum, charge. So you, you don't get out of the, the game that way. Um, so. I mean, you, can't, you cannot, for the, as far in the current state of quantum mechanics anyway, I mean, you know, of course this could change, you know, with. For, mm -hmm. But people try and, and look for consciousness. See, for in. example, you cannot, you cannot predict when the, uh, the, you know, the nucleus of, let's say, a radioactive particle is going to decay. You can predict mm -hmm. their certain probability of it happening at, you know, time X versus yeah. T0 versus T1 versus T2 probability, but you cannot predict ahead of time, you know, what that time is going to be. There's just yeah. a distribution of potential times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is at the current state of, knowledge and quantum mechanics, it is an unpredictable. But yeah. being, things being unpredictable are not, are not good for choice. So. No, that's not, not choice. Um, um, unpredictability is not choice. And this is where the, the, the information game shows up. Uh, intelligence is, is using information about the environment you're in to make choices that then allows you to extract energy. And so that's the connection that makes information physical, even though we don't normally think of information as being something you can measure. Um, so oh, it's, it's no, uh, frequently you've heard in the last 20 years, information is physical because it, you can use it to extract energy and then hence the laws of physics now apply to it. Um, so anyway, until the mathematics is, is, is put there to un undergird all my opinions, I'm, I'm not going to take them too much farther, other than that they've given me a perfect confidence that emergence is, in fact, will be grounded in physics. And then it just lets me explore all of the uh, implications of such a fact. And then I take it back to my faith. And then I have questions for Pastor Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah maybe we could get you and pastor paul together to talk that would well, be I, yeah who knows <laughs> so that's kind of where i'm coming from is uh, i guess so, let me just uh, read back to you i wrote i tried to catch some notes here that you said intelligence is using information about the environment you are in to make choices and you can use information to extract energy did i get those two correct i think that's yeah pretty good and then you use that energy to for self-replicating self-organizing self-sustaining and that's that's a life form it's, it's a it's just to borrow a word from Ghost in the Shell. It's a standalone complex now. And and I saw some massive disagreement on your face when when he was talking about that, Carl. So would yeah. you have to pitch in here then. Yeah, I don't think I think to I think for for to be real, you need to be able to actually have two representations in, in your mind. So like, that's why I say a bacteria has no choice. But the bacteria will do, only has one option that it will follow. It's completely pre-programmed pre and predictable. Uh, humans are very different. Humans are able to represent abstractly using their mind, potential futures. And those futures are different. You know, that's why we distinguish, unlike what that, you know, Sam Harris thinks, you know, that, that we don't have any free will. Um, we are able to distinguish between the decisions of a, a two-year-old as opposed to a full-grown adult, right? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between the two? In Sam Harris's world, there is zero difference. They're both completely determined by their physical properties. And so, you know, they should be treated exactly the same which is absurd. I mean, he yeah. doesn't believe what he says. He's, he's just a, a charlatan, as far as I'm concerned. Well, so let me, let me just throw in here on this because I, I did start thinking about this when I was watching the video about strong and weak emergence, because one of the things that um, they classified with weak emergence is that it's very reductionistic and yeah. that there's, um, there's no way for the 
emergent property to have an impact with a backwards causation. And that did make me think about Sam Harris and, and um, his view of the world. And it also made me think about a video that Paul did the other day when he was talking about the eye and how the eye is, is a very complex part of our bodies, but at the same time, it's not just a part of our bodies because, I mean, an eye cannot see basically, because if you take the eye out of the body and, and put it over here, it's no longer seeing. And if you take the eye away from the consciousness, it's no longer seeing because that eye is attached not only to my consciousness, but it's also attached to the entire history that I understand from all my family background growing up and the history that I've read and everything that makes up the matrix of who I am as an individual and all the relationships that I've had. So that when I see through that eye, I'm seeing something that is completely um, a unique perspective on whatever it is I'm seeing. It's, this is why a camera takes a picture, but it's not really seeing. A camera is just representing, a, you know, a, basically a bunch of zeros and ones. But when I see, I'm, the seeing is somehow deeply embedded in this whole idea of consciousness. And that, that what I see then goes back and impacts who I am and impacts my history and impacts the way that I relate with other people. And so all of these parts of my consciousness. So I got to thinking it's not just the eye that's like that, but it's our ears that are like that, our skin, all of our sense organs. They're all feeding information into the consciousness, but what arises then from the consciousness feeds back and affects everything about who I am and not only who I am, but all the people around me. So that kind of emergence is, um, I mean, it's like Sam Harris is not even, he, he's still in kindergarten. He's not even. Yeah, it's not on his radar at all. He's yeah. like, I don't take him seriously, honestly. I, I don't know even, I don't know why anybody takes him seriously. Uh, well, of course, part of it is because he's part of, you know, an echo chamber with people like Susan Blackmore and, and many others, uh, Dawkins, you know, I mean, they are all talk to each other and, you know, pat themselves on the back and they don't want to think about the hard things. And, you know, so to me, Sam Harris is, it's not just that he's wrong, it's just so blatantly wrong, it's ridiculous. And like so Nassim Taleb calls him an entertainer. A what? Entertainer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that's all he does is just entertain. It's mm -hmm. nonsense, but. Um, yeah, but it, the, you're actually, if you're right, you know, there's the, there's the backward feedback from the emerging system back, you know, in, in, in a cybernetics, it's called the meta system transition. So you, you have an emergent system that now takes over control of what used to be controlled at a lower level, but now there is integration at a higher level of the multiple mm -hmm. systems. And now the overall, uh, architecture is controlled from the top level to some extent. It, although it's a, it's a feedback loop. So you know, the subsystems feed back into the top, which feeds back into the bottom. And it's a continuous loop like this that goes on forever and ever. Of course, in the human systems, it's even more complicated because we are definitely self-referential, unlike a bacteria. Let's say bacteria has no consciousness of itself. I mean, it, it's conscious, you know, well, I don't know. In the case of bacteria, it might, but let's say, let's take a, a mouse or something simple, a beetle, obviously is conscious of its environment. It's able to detect input from its environment and integrate it into its tiny brain. But as far as we can tell anyway, it's not really conscious that it itself um, is, is uh, you know, is significantly distinguishable for its, from its environment. I mean, it just reacts to, to its environment and does what it's programmed to do. You know, that's why I don't think a beetle or a, certainly a bacteria or something like this, bacterium has choice. You know. So unlike creatures that can actually represent ahead of time what their future state might be, you know, 
hypothetically, then those creatures have choice. If they can consciously hold in their brain two different potential outcomes, then they can choose one of those. If you, if you can't represent more than one outcome, you don't have a choice. You have to do that. You know, there's, there is no choice possible if you cannot represent ahead of time what the outcome of your action is going to be. And I don't think okay, so. So what? So what we have here is a semantic problem. I think it's just a semantic yes. problem. Am I right, Glenn? That it's just you're using mm -hmm. the, the word choice in a slightly different way than Carl is using it. Yeah, I would say probably qualitatively different. Um, like to me, choice is conscious. I mean, you know, it's a conscious choice. If it's not conscious, it's not a choice. You know, if I'm gonna say, if i if even for me, if somebody puts me under the uh, the effect of a say a psychedelic drug and or or perhaps you know hypnotizes me you know like i don't i don't know i mean the hypnosis is gonna have an interest mm -hmm. and then makes me do action x you know uh, then i didn't have a choice because i'm no longer able to represent uh different futures and act on them um but as long as i've got the ability uh, and that's why you know perhaps a mentally ill person who does not no longer has the ability to represent um, futures uh, to themselves, you know, to put themselves into the future abstractly in different situations. Um, you know, maybe they don't have free will either. They don't have a choice anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, but one year but old, the, the one-year-old baby doesn't have a lot of choice. The reason I'm sticking with trying to get back to what Glenn was saying, though, is that you're talking about choice strictly from the viewpoint of consciousness, but Glenn is trying to represent something to us here about the very beginnings of life and how that arose out of the physical universe. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get back to that, but in order to get back to that, we have to let Glenn use language the way he needs to use it in order to explain his idea. Uh, well, no, 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 I will not allow that. No, you cannot use words in ways that are personal because then there is no dialogue possible. We have to use words as close to possible to the common, to the common usage of that word. Otherwise, well, what, what word would you do this all the time? They try to define oh, oh, stuff. Yeah, I understand. I understand what your problem is right there, Carl, because we're going to go into this whole postmodern thing, and I agree with you. But in order to talk about Glenn's idea, we need to have a word that represents this binary on or off. And what would you like that word to be, so that is we can continue with the conversation? Question for me. Yeah. Um, I, I'd start by noting that as you talk about free will and choice, you always use the word you in reference to uh, your human nature. And I'm trying to take choice and put it in an abstract mathematical sense. And then you object, well, in the sense of, well, that's not the way every, anybody uses it. But then my comeback is, well, that's the reason why emergence never gets anywhere, that the mathematician in me, the physicist in me says, if you're gonna discuss the subject, you need to peel it back down to a, a rigorous formal definition that you can handle and deal with mathematically. And because that doesn't look like what people normally associate with choice, then they reject that pathway and then you know, we get no a different word. I don't care which one. Just make one up. If Choice you is the only word that comes to to mind. So well, then, well, sorry. <laughs> so well, you yeah. don't agree, Carl. That's okay, but you can still let Glenn explain his idea, right? So yeah, there's a lot of things. Oh, he's mathematics. lost me. He's lost me. Well, you can explain it to the audience. You can't explain it to me using that word. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fair. No, but you can go into mathematics and physics where they're they're using English words. To, to say to mean things which are radically different uh, than the normal vernacular. So I can't think of anything right off at the top of my head, but uh, my feeling, the mathematician in me says, I can define anything any way I want, as long as I formally state it in a way that it can be worked with mathematically. After which then if, well, in theoretical physics, no one asks you to defend your assumptions before you start your theoretical work. 
no matter, so you can pick the craziest things than you want, but if you can formalize those mathematically, show that they imply what their implications are, that that matches known, you know, experimental data. And then even better, if it makes predictions that have about phenomena that haven't been found, then you go back and then say, okay, well, maybe your assumptions, however crazy they sounded, might have value. So in my quest uh, in emergence, that's the frustrating point is that the, the language keeps getting in the way and it keeps coming back to me. Yeah, because there's no formal definition of what emergence is or choice or intelligence or what even life is. So you keep peeling it down until you find some minimal point. And then what, do you, what word do you use? Well, you have to borrow a word from natural language and that's the best you can do. And so I think that's our impasse is that I'm using the word choice in a different way than, than you're used to. And you're saying, well, I can't go there. So the, the debate is over rather than trying to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, that's, 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 that's what I'm saying. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot use words. Uh, this is, people do this, try to, you know, say, well, in my world, this word means this. I said, oh, well, that's very fine. But, you know, then basically what you're saying is, I don't want to talk to you because I'm using words like what people commonly, I, sometimes you do have to invent new words for something, you know, you do, you're more than welcome to this. If, if nothing, if nothing that's existing fits, uh, and this happens a lot, you know, in IT and stuff, they, people have to invent a bunch of the new words mm -hmm. for, for new things, you know, that didn't exist before. They didn't necessarily have to be tied to uh, ancient, you know, 18th century world to describe the world of computers and information technology and programs and stuff like that. They had to invent new words. And uh, that's, that's fine. I have no issues with that, you know, as long as they're more or less give a pretty good definition of what their words applies to. Yeah. But using common day, common everyday words to describe something radically different is super dangerous, super dangerous. It just, That's why it's required. I cannot, that you, I cannot go there. You formalize it. But, but I noticed that you can't even get to the formal level, whether regardless of the word, because you say a bacteria doesn't have choice. But in fact, right. It does. It's running a program. Yes. So a program is a piece of intelligence running on some kind of computational engine. And it could be... You're saying, you're saying my calculator, when I type in 2 plus 2 equals, it has a choice as to giving me the answer 4? Yes. It's running a program. Okay, well, but, uh, then no. Completely disagree. Completely disagree. Mm -hmm. yeah, choice. Well... Okay, Carl, it's okay for you to disagree, but I want to hear what Glenn has to say. I mean, I'm a part of the conversation. He just said it. He just hmm? said it. He just said it has a choice. Well, I, but, no, he doesn't. So, Carl, there's a bigger choice. idea here, and I want to get to the bigger idea, but I can't get to it if you won't let him talk. So, I, I want just to hear did. the bigger idea. Let him, I just did let him talk. He yeah, said, okay. So, that's, that's, so now it's Glenn's turn. Okay. I want well, to hear okay, what Glenn has to say. So where did the calculator come from? How does the chip program to work? There, there's a human involved in multiple levels. And that calculator is, is a, a bit of, of our intelligence that has been put into a machine. And I, I've, I've looped on that idea a little bit. You know, what was it, the, old, the concept of a golem or um, from the Jewish? You create this this thing, and then you can give it gift it some intelligence. Then it uh, can become a proxy for you. So, what a calculator is doing is an example of choice and intelligence, and it is an artifact uh, that humans have made, and it, can, it contains right. some of us. A calculator will never pop up out of nowhere. So, okay. All right. so yeah. <laughs> But see, I, my world, I you have know. to disagree, agree to disagree, because this is just, uh, yeah, no. Well, it's, okay, so, so I, I see where the problem is now. It's I, beyond. I, so, no. so now it's my turn. Okay. okay. 
I see where the problem is. The problem is that when Glenn is talking about this, he's going back a further step, okay? Because calculator is not just a calculator. Calculator is something that was created out of intelligence. And so a calculator is making the choices that I'm asking it. If, if I'm the one who built the calculator, and if I programmed the calculator, the calculator is making the choices that I made running through the calculator. Have I got it right, Glenn? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's the way to think so, about it. So a bacteria, even a bacteria has an immense amount of information in it that is already programmed. And that, that bacteria is operating on that program. And where did that program come from? I think that's what Glenn is trying to get at. Am I right? Yes, you get it, yeah. Because it's whoever programmed that program that is making the choice. So there is a choice there, a choice that's coming out of consciousness. Now, it's a different point of view than you have, Carl, but it is certainly a point of view that if you really believe in freedom, everybody ought to be able to talk about their point of view. Okay. Okay. No, so now let's yeah. let Glenn talk about this. So idea, I this, find this, uh, this might help a little bit more that, um, to give my, my background, how I, how I arrived here. It's, um, as an, as an undergrad in physics, I got really fascinated with the crossover between math and physics. And it's sort of gifted at being equally good at both. And so I've always been drawn to the, the crossover of mathematical physics. And um, one of the first things as an undergrad, I noticed the, the crossover between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And, you know, we'll get, a little technical, the Poisson bracket formalism is in classical mechanics is so reminiscent of quantum mechanics. I kept wondering, there's got to be something there. So when I applied to grad school, that's how I ended up at Santa Cruz. Because Ralph Abraham, who was one of the leading guys in classical mechanics, was in the math department. So I assumed I would get a physics PhD, but do my work through Ralph Abraham. Unfortunately, when I got to Santa Cruz, I found out he wasn't taking grad students anymore. So life took a detour. But uh, along the way, I've had uh, courses in math logic and, and gone through formal systems, formal, you know, first order predicate. I've gone through, um, this is 30 plus years ago, at least a skeleton of Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Uh, I've also been into um, theory of computation, so come up through state machines and Chomsky hierarchy of languages, Turing machines and stuff like that. So my approach to thinking is, is much more formal, uh, formally grounded than I think that you're used to. So when I look at some a no, thinking machine, no, I could think of a state machine. <laughs> bad assumption. I've right on But go ahead. What? I can't. You're, you're I write out. all this stuff. Yeah. So when I think of a thinking machine or intelligence, I'm I can I'm I'm going down to state machine level. I'm looking at a, a program running on a state machine, um, defined by formal languages and stuff. And what I'm intrigued by is does the laws of physics allow for such a thing as a formal language to even occur? Does the laws of physics even allow? Um, a state machine to exist. So before you can build a state machine to actually run, you know, a program, you have, physics has to allow it to be built. And so that's where I'm, I'm finding myself arriving, rising at. Before you can build a calculator, the laws of physics have to allow that you can do that. So that's the fundamental level I've reached. And I have no other word for it than choice. Because in order to calculate, to do anything, that means the future is not perfectly predictable from the past. Something has to happen that something new transitions from the past. Otherwise, there'd be no calculations. There'd be no intelligence. You couldn't, all the formal stuff would, would make no sense. So, then, so this gets right at something that Jordan Peterson got me thinking about that I have not been able to stop thinking about, and that is his whole idea of anomaly. And the idea that anomaly is 
when, when I took his idea of anomaly at the at the uh, human level, and I started trying to drive it back in my own mind in evolution, it went back for me all the way back to the very beginning that that every bit of increase in intelligence that or increase in information that takes place within the living cell is a result of the 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 creature whatever the creature is reacting to anomaly and that adapting to anomaly is what increases information in the cell so there in my mind there is some sense in which that adaptation to anomaly is a choice when here's a very simple explanation a very simple example let's say an ant is crawling along and there's a a rock in its path you know, some ants might go to the right, some ants might go to the left, some ants might climb over the rock. The ant that climbs over the rock is probably going to gain information over the ants that are going to the right or to the left because that rock in the path is an anomaly and it requires some new skills to get over. And that's going to increase the amount of information epigenetically that that, that, that ant has got. And over time, those kinds of increase in information are going to make a difference in the in the organism developing and that that that's how if and i i'm still of two minds i can see evolution or not evolution but but in in the grand picture of evolution if i'm going to accept all of that to me that's the only way we get to 3.4 billion letters in in our current genetic code from what was in the beginning no information at all or almost no information at all is this constant adaptation to anomaly because that I can abstract all the way up to the human level in the way that that each of us even deals with suffering in our lives you know that that we adapt to that anomaly coming in and that grows us as individuals and causes us to become stronger and uh, more compassionate and more capable and, and all of those things but that drives all the way back down to the very beginning so does that make any sense with what you're trying to say, Glenn? Trying to. I, you know, I appreciate the concept of anomaly because it's the things that are different that is telling you what's important in life. Uh, in, in a world that is completely static, there's, there's no information and there's no energy to be gathered. So every time you notice something different, but not every anomaly might be useful. <laughs> But I think that's partly. Uh, but anyway, I, I think I'm I'm losing my train of thought here. But there's a there is an awareness that there's something else going on, and that's one of the things I'd hoped to, to touch on is, if you buy emergence, then, as 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 a, a real. You know, phenomena. How would you look for it in the in scripture? And there's a, you call it downward causality. That's one of the hallmarks of strong emergence is that once the emergent behavior pattern um, comes into being, it has a strong downward influence on, on the individuals making the up the phenomena. So uh, you might imagine a system of individuals with a set of rules that it allows them to interact. So again, um, going back to cellular automata, something like the game of life, uh, you can see it in the ant colonies that each of the individuals have a, a small set of simple rules by which they interact with each other. But somehow out of those simple rules of inner, you know, individual to individual react, action, a collective consciousness, consciousness or collective intelligence starts to form up that then starts behaving as a unique individual life form as it in its own right. So what are the rules that we as human beings are equipped with that allows us to interact as a, as a, a big group to form something bigger like a society or a culture? And I start with a sense of self is where you find out. And there's a set of rules that we each interact with each other with, which together then forms some bigger collective consciousness called our society or our culture. 
and then society has a downward causation on us, you know, determining what's good and proper behavior and what isn't, which then we incorporate into our sense of self. And so if you live in a world where carpenters are considered uh, the premier individuals, then you'll probably want to be a carpenter. And if you, you can't be a carpenter for whatever reason, then you'll feel bad about yourself. Um, so there's rules to society that society imposes on individuals to keep an emergent behavior going stably. And, uh, and I often fascinate, then I look at Leviticus and some of those silly rules that maybe what you're looking at is the emergent system, the, the, the higher society is pushing downward causation on the individuals um, in their individual behaviors so that the upper culture stays intact. So that's the kind of things that fascinate me. Um, but also but, you are still working on this formal mathematical um, yeah, well, my, my feeling is, is my opinions in $5 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So until I can actually put some math to, to what I'm trying to say, that there's no point you need to really listen to me. So you're okay in that respect, Carl. Until, until I can show you the equations, then, then, then whatever. I'm just another person. So, but I do believe it's possible. Well, I'd certainly like to pursue that again in another conversation, Glenn. I would very much like to pursue that. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Is there anything and, uh, you'd like to say to wrap up, Carl? <clears throat> well, I guess, yeah, I have a completely different view of things, so I guess. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> well, in, in a sense, that's good because that's one of the reasons I think the debate in emergence doesn't get very far is because there's not enough back and forth of ideas that challenge each other. You know, again, the evolution of ideas takes a period of negative feedback and then a period of positive feedback. And a lot of academia has become an echo chamber of, of people speaking the same language and speaking the same things over and over again. And then it takes someone like me to come in and say, well, no, wait a second, there's a different way. And then everybody piles on you, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, there is a different way for sure. I, I agree with that. I just don't think you're, I, know, I, I disagree. Okay, that. yeah, I understand. I'm not, I'm having There's a different way actually. for sure. But in my opinion, you're on the wrong track. You said a lot of correct, you know, I, I like your ideas about downward causation and, you know, Karen mentioned that. Of course, that's completely valid. That is a key characteristic of emergent systems or, you know, strongly emergent systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, society as an emergent system, you know, human society, completely agree with that. Um, I don't think you'll ever be able to formalize it mathematically. I, I think that's, uh, you know, I, but okay, go ahead, you know, <laughs> uh, give it a try. I don't think you need mathematics. I, I don't think you need math to make sense of stuff. Um, there's plenty of other tools available in science besides math, uh, uh, logic being one of them. But, you know, yeah. But logic is mathematics, mm -hmm. but it's purest form. So, well, no, no, no. Again, I, oh, I guess we'll have to agree. To <laughs> it's not. I mean, mathematic is no requires logic, obviously. Uh, but the other way around, no. So, uh, so it's a you know it's a one way street. So it's, it's, uh, logic is necessary for mathematics, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's not I could disagree with everything you said, but for, for the fundamentally, um, when, you, when you talk about, uh, you know, choice being something that's applicable to, you know, even the lowest level of, of physics, you, you remind me of the panpsychism of, of certain people, which to me is an absolutely absurd uh, take on the universe. I, I, you know, that, that the fact that we are conscious because each little individual atom uh, that makes up our brain or whatever, or our body is, has a little tiny portion of consciousness. And then you just add them up together and you come up with a big consciousness is just, yeah, well, that's, that's something I'm even willing to entertain for one second. Yeah. But I don't go there, but I, well, but you're getting pretty close with this thing about choice. So, 
See, that's the thing. That's my point. I mm -hmm. think, I think if you, if you say the bacterium has choice, you're using the word choice in a way that most people won't uh, absolutely not understand what you're talking about. Well, you said, you, you said, you said your calculator has, has choice. It has choice. I, or it's exercising choice. I don't say that. I say it's, it's an entity that's exercising the faculty or the, of choice. It's not doing it. It's just a vehicle for that. And, and oh, you, you, you did say the calculator, a Texas instrument calculator is doing two plus two equals four. Could have given me a different answer than four. That's not what he said. That's not what he said at well, all. That is what he said. No, he said it's exercising choice. Exactly. A choice that's, that was a choice that was programmed into it. By no, 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 no. If if you if you're programmed to come up with an answer, you don't have a choice. You understand the distinction? Yeah. Carl, yeah, I understand the distinction that you're making what you're perfectly. Saying, I understand what Glenn is saying. I'm not. But I'm just saying it's not a useful one to make. It doesn't let you go very far. You can you can use words like novelty, options, uh, you know. Uh, uh, potentialities. I, I don't have any problem with all things. I have a problem, a serious problem with the word choice. Uh, you can say there are different potentialities, there are different, you know, options, you know, di different paths possible for the future. You know, I, I'm not a determinist, so I, I agree with all these things, but choice has a very different meaning than this. Well, uh, the laws of physics are not perfectly deterministic. That's where that's the fundamental statement. So, that's if the future is not perfectly determined by the past, then what do you call it when an entity picks one path or another out of the possible ones into the future? But see, to pick a path, you have to be aware of the potential of the potential different path. Yes. If you're it's not, if you're aware form. of only one path. And you're forced to choose that path because that's the only one you know, you don't have a choice. Yes, but a bacteria is conscious of its environment. A plant is conscious of its environment. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah but it's choices. completely programmed. It cannot picture in its mind that I can go here or there. It just says, I have to go there because that's where the food is or whatever it is. Yeah, that's, it's that's running a program someplace. That is the only option it has. But why, why is it going towards the food? Carl. For yeah. choice to exist, you have to have the ability to represent your future state. But Carl, we're, you, you got to go down underneath one more level. Why is the bacteria going towards food? You say it only, that's the only choice it has. It has to go that's, towards food. That is its program. Oh, oh, it is its program then. Okay, yeah. then you're saying exactly the same thing that Glenn is saying. Exactly. No, I'm saying it's the exact what? opposite. <laughs> no, you're saying exactly the same thing. If you're programmed to do something, you don't have a choice of doing that thing. Do you get, do you understand? Yeah, I understand the, perfectly. You're no, programmed to how, do something. How, where you did don't the program have a come choice. From? Where did the program come from? From evolution. Bingo. <laughs> okay. And, and when life first arose, there was already a program in place. The very first life already had some sort of program to go towards life, to make a choice for life, to go towards the food. Yes. No, it, not, not a choice. No, no, well, it was it was a random event. It was a ran it was a random event. He didn't make so, a choice. So the first one had a random event, and then everyone after that said, "What?" Then everyone no after that, "What?" No, no choice. Purely physical processing. Okay, so not that, deterministic processes, mind you. Not deterministic. Pro you know, don't confuse a physical process with a deterministic process necessarily. As we said, you know, quantum mechanics allows for variation for for chance. You know, and chance, as you pointed out before correctly, is an absolute requirement for things to evolve. You know, see, you I would say quantum mechanics is still systems. perfectly deterministic. It's just mm -hmm. that it gives a. a a range of answers, but it's still perfectly deterministic as to what comes out. Well, you see, you just said the exact opposite like five minutes ago. You said, you said physics is not deterministic. Now you say it is, or I don't know. I said quantum mechanics. 
as a formal system mathematically presented. Yeah, it's not Schrodinger wave equation, but is Schrodinger wave equation the proper mathematics to be doing quantum mechanics in to begin with? Well, that's there's more than my, one interpretation of quantum mechanics. The current the current understanding you know, the consensus understanding, now I know Einstein said, you know, until we discover the underlying more fundamental construct that will explain the higher, you know, the quantum mechanics as a higher level of something even more fundamental, what, what we know now, and experiment kind of tends to show that it is, and uh, at the microscopic level, of course, because of decoherence, you know, at the macro level, and in, in some cases at, at the macro level as well, because of the decoherence, it does become deterministic at the higher level. But at, at the level of fundamental particles, it is very indeterministic. Well, obviously we've opened up another whole avenue for conversation here, which we don't have time to go into at this point. So, so we can hold this for a future talk, but, um, it has been great to get inside both your minds. And uh, we obviously have some disagreements, but as we said, that's where new ideas come from because people have to listen to opposing views in order to generate new thoughts. So I appreciate both of you being here with me today. And okay. I can't wait to talk to each of you again in the future. Nice to meet you, Carl. Okay. And, and thanks for twisting my arm and talking me into this, Karen. So it's a new adventure for me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's been really good. And it, it uh, got my blood pressure going. You, you guys know I had this surgery a while back and yeah. uh, just recovering from the surgery has taken me longer than I expected. And I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to maintain any sort of uh, mental coherence in a conversation, but I think it's working out okay, so. Yeah, you did fine. Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah. You're not 20 lost, years old anymore. You haven't lost a step. <laughs> so have a great day, guys. Hey. And, uh, I'll okay. see you on the other side of the election, I guess. Yes, yeah, right. I'm going to hibernate until afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to avoid all television, radio, Twitter, everything. Until it's I'm over. cutting myself. <laughs> this is the last time I'm on the computer until in the next week. Yeah. So good talking to you guys, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.